So this is one of my heroes, Yogi Berra, an Italian philosopher from the city of New York. He had a way with words. Right, Dan? Right? I mean, what he said made no sense, and it made sense, which is making it harder to make sense. Like, that shouldn't make sense, but it does. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. That's what Yogi said. This is a little better. In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. That might not sound so profound to you right now. I'm going to try to make it more profound because we're really good in the church about talking about theory. Right? We learn a lot of theory, but we're short on how do I implement this in my specific situation, right? And that's part of what we're here for. That's why it's good to go grab a cup of coffee after service and hang out with people and get to talk to them and, and get to know them. And we have so many amazing, gifted people in this church. It's, it's a beautiful thing. So... We have to be intentional about that, though. But I have found if you go in with the idea that I have something to learn from you, then I'm just as happy to be there maybe as you are because nobody has a corner on all knowledge. Listen, it's only wisdom when you put it to use. It's just theory. It's plenty good to have the theory, but you have to also then put it into practice. I guess you can tell I get frustrated by this point. So here's a commentary. It says, if we really love the Lord, we will love his children. So look around next to you and tell somebody you love them because they're a child of God. I love you. <laughs> and if we really love his children, then we will point them away from destruction road. Remember, the wide road leads to destruction. And we will lead them onto the flourishing life parkway. All right, so that person that finds that narrow road more and more often is living a more flourishing life than they would have if they didn't. So it's, we're not comparing ourselves to each other because we all got dealt a different hand in life, and we don't want to do that. We don't compare to other people, but I can compare me to me yesterday. And is me today more like Jesus than me yesterday? That's a flourishing life. And it keeps getting more fully flourishing the more we do that. Like Paul, I like this. This is, we are born out of time. What does that mean? You remember when he said that, right? That, that the Lord had appeared to him, even though he wasn't one of the disciples that was traveling in the ministry, the Lord appeared to him. Remember, when did that happen? On the road to Damascus, right? And, and the Lord appears to him. And he says, like one born out of time. And I just want to put a positive spin on that for you. Because if God is not in time, but we are, part of our struggle is to get in God's time while we're in time. And that's why the drummer is the most important musician in the band. In my opinion. In my very humble opinion. Because when they're off, everybody's off. And you can't shut them off in the booth because <laughs> everybody will still hear it. I'll leave that alone. But what they're trying to do is hear the rhythm of heaven and bring it into a time-bound earth. A timeless rhythm that has to be brought into a time-bound earth. And when it happens well, we get in a portal. And we feel the presence of God. And people give testimony that they got healed. Nobody prayed for them. Nobody touched them. It wasn't even the one-step program. It was worship. How would you get healed? I don't know. I left the house this morning. I couldn't see. Now I can see. You go figure out how it happened. I just know I can see. Hallelujah. So we're born out of time, which means that we can't allow the culture to overtake us in our decision making as hard as they're trying to do that. So we're born out of time in a good way because we're always going to be in God's time. And the better we are at translating that timeless truth into the next generations, the more likely they'll live a flourishing life. And that's what we all want for the people we love, flourishing life. It's going to mean something different for each one of us from a fact pattern. But flourishing to you means something different to me. But are you flourishing? And if you ask people if they feel like that, many will say no. If they even like their job, many will say no. So they just have to do it. They have to keep showing up, but there's not a lot of grace on them for it. And that's not a fun place to be. How about the sons of Issachar? They knew the times and the seasons, and they knew what Israel should do. How many want that anointing? Oh, yeah. Not just to know the theory, but to know the practice. This is the role of the apostle and the prophet. 
That's why it says in Corinthians that the foundation of the church is built on that foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Because the prophets are hearing the Lord and the apostles are trying to execute on the plan that they're getting. And they have to work together. I'm pointing at my wife because that's how it's been for us. She's more the prophet. I'm more the apostolic person that builds. But I got to hear what she's saying. Hopefully she's hearing what I'm saying too because when it works well, that's when you get the best results. And if you want a flourishing church, keep praying that that happens. Pray for us and the leaders that that will happen. I'm going to go a little faster now. It says, the disciples came to Jesus, questioned him about the kingdom. Jesus called a little child and said, this is the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. In that kingdom, the most humble, who are the most like this child, are the greatest. They didn't want to hear this. This sounded like another one of those weird sayings, another riddle he was telling. Similarly, in Mark 10, he said the people brought their children to see Jesus, hoping that he might grant them this blessing, but his disciples turned them away. Wow is right. Thank you, Nate, my foot pedal. He turned them away. The disciples turned them away. They forgot what he said. This is the example of how we're supposed to be. And you can think of the innocence of a child and all, right? But, but what about the fact that their minds are like sponges? They're always wanting to learn. They don't think they've arrived. They're humble about it. If they, if they don't know how to swim, they don't know how to swim. Christians act like they do. Because <laughs> we don't want to look bad. Whatever. I'm just saying, becoming like a little child is not to be childish. It's to be childlike. That's what he's saying. Be childlike in, in the way you approach the kingdom. But also be intentional about speaking to the children because you can learn something from them. Somebody's happy. Hallelujah. I thought it was one of the kids in the balcony. but When Jesus saw this, he was incensed. Wow. He never sinned, but he was incensed. He was singed, <laughs> but he didn't sin. So you can be angry and not sin. It's really hard. So be careful. It's really hard. He said, let the children come to me and don't ever stand in their way, for this is the kingdom, what the kingdom of God is all about. Truly anyone who doesn't accept the kingdom of God as a little child can never see it. So we go in with awe-filled wonder. What are you going to show me today, Lord? Well, I've read that chapter 45 times. I've taught three different classes on it. Doesn't matter. This doesn't change. You do. <laughs> okay? As you're changing, you look at the truth and you see it through a whole different lens. Man, I'll tell you, it's an amazing book. There's nothing like it. It's alive. Keep studying. Keep praying. Ask the Lord. Remove the blockage so that I can get it and understand it. Almost done with the analogy here. Firstborn son in Deuteronomy, it says he gets a double portion of all that the father has. That doesn't mean he gets everything, but if there's four kids, the first one gets twice as much as the next three in the inheritance. Why? Are they showing favoritism? No. It's that the oldest son is going to be expected to run the family after the father's gone. So there's a lot more responsibility involved in that. And those three younger siblings are not going to always like the decision. So God's saying, I'll give you a little bonus here because it's a tough job. <laughs> Anybody been in that role? Been an executor of, of an estate? Oh, man, you see some demons coming out. <laughs> so people don't always understand this, but it says... That the fa it's the first fruits. That son is the first fruits of the father's strength. The right of the firstborn belongs to him. It's not all cheerful because you get twice as much. You get twice as much responsibility or more. And not everybody's up to it. If you watch the movie The King's Speech about one of the kings of England, his older brother was entitled to get it, but the older brother took, said, no, I don't want it. You can have it. And God doesn't like that. See, God wants us to step up for our responsibilities. And take that obligation and not cruise. See, the, those families had all been kings and queens throughout. And now the older brother's like, no, I'm going to check out. Because this is a, tr a tough one to understand too. In Romans 9, uh, Paul refers to Rebecca. And God had told Rebecca that the older twin is going to serve the younger twin. That's not how it normally would be. What do you think that could mean? Those of you who are buried into your fur coats, so sorry. As it is written... Jacob I've loved, but Esau I hated. God is saying he hates somebody. 
What? Well, look, Esau was the one who should have been willing to take on the father's double portion. He was the older of the two. And he traded it for a bowl of porridge, whatever that is. Not a good trade. And everybody's so tough on Jacob. Well, he didn't have to say yes. So did I really steal it? Well, later you stole it because you and your mom conned your father. But in that moment that he gave away his, his, his right, then God could be saying, well, why would I want to give it to somebody who doesn't want it? 